how does a commercial airliner lose literally tens of thousands of feet in one to two minutes? And it's not on purpose, by the way. Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com. You are listening to the Commercial Pilot Podcast brought to you by our number one rated online ground school. Visit groundschoolacademy.com to learn more. Don't just prep for a written test, prep for a check ride. Prepare for mastery. Prepare to be a safe real world pilot. That's what we're doing with all our online ground school members now. And I hope you'll join us and be a part of that. We're taking a deeper dive today into Air China 006. This is actually an accident I shared just yesterday, as well as it's an accident I shared at, I believe it was the first aviation mastery event in Orlando. Speaking of that, I hope you'll be joining us for upcoming aviation mastery events as well. Aviationmastery.com to learn more about that. By the way, Sun and Fun is just around the corner, March 31st through April 5th. Uh, come join us in Hangar D, Hangar Delta over at Sun and Fun. My good friend Steve O will be in the booth that Saturday at 12 p.m. as well, from 12 to 1 in the booth in Hangar D with Steve O. Come by and say hi. Also, March 26th, next week at 3 p.m., my JFK or our JFK Jr. live stream to the M0A.com YouTube and Facebook channels. You'll want to be there. Trust me. I'll, just like all these, these great podcasts we're putting out, the great videos, the online ground school members have seen the great new webinars we're putting out. A lot of love. A lot of very, very smart minds have worked on this JFK Jr. Uh, accident analysis and recreation, and I would encourage you highly to, uh, to be there and to check that out. Anyways, our purpose today, commercial pilots, we're talking about is Air China 006. And if you listen to all our podcast brands, remember we do the private pilot podcast, the instrument pilot podcast, the commercial pilot podcast, and of course, the CFI podcast as well. I encourage you to listen to all of them on iTunes. It would mean the absolute world to us. You know, we've been in the 7700 series. 7700, of course, the emergency transponder squat code, diving into and talking about and learning as much as we can about accidents. I don't like talking about accidents, but I believe we're doing the pilots involved in them a disservice if we don't take the time to learn more about them. Let's dive into, let's learn more about Air China Flight 006. The aircraft departed from Taipei at 1622 local time. The accident occurred 10 hours into the flight. It was a Boeing 747 SP-9. It was 350 nautical miles northwest of San Francisco, cruising at an altitude of 41,000 feet. The captain had approximately 15,500 flight hours. Our first officer had more than 7,700 flight hours. The flight engineer had another 15,500 hours of flight time. There was also a, re a relief crew on board for this long of a flight. However, the main crew was on duty during this flight. I share their hours because like United Flight 173, like a lot of accidents we've spoken about here, this is an experienced crew. 15,000 hours is a lot of time. You'd expect you to stop making mistakes eventually. But I share these numbers to share with you and, and impress upon you that more experience doesn't make you immune to accidents. We have to be so smart, so diligent. More hours, more experience does not always make us a safer pilot. The sequence in our accident begins with a loss of thrust in the number four engine. Now that engine had failed twice during previous flights while cruising at 41,000 feet and 43,000 feet. In each of those cases, the engine was restarted after descending to a lower altitude. The maintenance response to the logbook entries that noted the problems included an engine inspection, 
fuel filter drainage and replacement, vein controller inspection and replacement, water drainage from the mock probes, and other filter replacements. None of those acts fix the recurrent problem of engine number four. Isn't it great to be taken off in an airplane that kind of always has, uh, yeah, you know, that number four engine kind of always quits on you at, at 41,000 feet or above 40,000 feet. It sounds like just the airplane uh, I want to be flying now, right? Uh, not... <laughs> <laughs> I'm weird about uh, about maintenance. I'll have mechanics uh, chase a ghost sometimes looking for something that I think the airplane did or shouldn't be doing or is doing, whatever it may be. So anyways, we lose thrust. We lose engine number four. It's honestly, with four engines, it's not life or death. It's not a big deal. It is an inconvenience, and it's just been written up a few times in this case. The flight engineer attempted to restore power to the engine, but didn't close the bleed valve as required in the checklist procedure. After the flight engineer announced the engine had been flamed out. So we attempted a restart. We didn't follow the correct procedure, which then caused the engine to fully flame out. So the captain instructed him to restart it and ordered the first officer to request a clearance for a descent from 41,000 feet. Because according to the flight manual, as we spoke about earlier, an engine restart is unlikely to succeed above 30,000 feet. They tried to start it up there and the attempt simply failed. Now, meanwhile, as they've lost now engine number four and they're trying to figure out this restart and do they want to descend and all these other things, the airspeed is continuing to decrease. The autopilot has now rolled the control wheel to the maximum left limit of 23 degrees as the speed decreases further. What's one of the first things you do if you have an engine failure? In most aircraft I fly, it's gonna disconnect the autopilot for you, but the autopilot stays engaged. I know they have four engines, so it's a little bit different. The autopilot stays engaged, yet it's taken the control wheel now to a maximum left limit of 23 degrees. As the speed decreases even further, the plane begins a slow roll to the right. Even though the autopilot was maintaining the maximum left roll limit. By the time the captain disconnected the autopilot, the plane had rolled over 60 degrees to the right. And then the nose began to drop. How does an aircraft just roll 60 degrees to the right until you realize it? How many of you out there were nervous doing steep turns? And you're looking out your window going, that's a long way down, this looks really steep. Now step it up to commercial pilot level, steep turns even a little steeper. The aircraft has rolled 60 degrees to the right, but it happened so gradually, so slowly, just a degree every 10 seconds or so, it was just barely working its way in there, maybe a little faster than that, but you know what I mean? It happened so slowly that by the time he disconnects the autopilot, they're in a 60 degree bank and of course, the nose is now starting to drop, just as we'd expect with a steep turn like that. The ailerons and flight spoilers were the only means available to the autopilot to keep the wings level, as the autopilot does not connect to the rudder during normal flight. So to counteract the asymmetrical forces uh, created by the loss from the number, number four engine, it was essential for the pilot to manually push the left rudder. However, the captain failed to use any rudder inputs at all before or after disconnecting the autopilot. So you had just rolled into a 60 degree right bank. The autopilot was fighting you with 23 degrees uh, of control wheel in the opposite direction. You disconnect the autopilot. Your feet are flat on the floor, not on the rudder pedals. The moment you disconnect that autopilot, that control wheel goes back to neutral where on earth do you think this airplane is going to go? Well, you can only imagine here. So the captain failed to use any rudder inputs at all before or after disconnecting the autopilot. Now the plane is descending quickly through the clouds. The captain's attention was drawn first to the attitude indicator as they're descending through the clouds now, which he says displayed excessive bank and pitch. He also said, the attitude indicator looked so irregular, it looked as though that pitch and bank angle was not possible. So he assumed it was incorrect and he assumed the indicator was faulty. It was not faulty. Air China was almost upside down, spiraling 
towards the ground in a nose down attitude. He looked at the attitude indicator because it was such a crazy seeing all that brown and down into the to the right on the attitude indicator. He said, "There's no way that is a real reading. This thing must be broken." Everything shows it was not broken. It was working perfectly, just like it should. Um, that is the true state of where we actually were. Now, without any visual references due to the clouds and having rejected the information from our instruments, the captain and the first officer experience spatial disorientation. Only after breaking through the bottom of the clouds, just two minutes later, at 11,000 feet, we went from 41,000 feet to 11,000 feet in a little less than two minutes. Then the captain was able to orient himself and bring the airplane under control, leveling out at 9,600 feet. They had descended over 30,000 feet in two minutes, while all on board experienced G-forces as high as 5 Gs. The cockpit crew believed that all four engines had actually flamed out, but the NTSB found that only that pesky engine number four had failed. After leveling out, the three remaining engines were supply normal thrust. A restart attempt brought number four back to use, and they began climbing and reported to air traffic control they were now under normal conditions and continuing on to Los Angeles. They then noticed the inboard main landing gear was down, and one of the plane's hydraulic systems was empty. And because of now the low altitude and this increase in drag, by the added landing gear, they didn't have enough fuel to make it to Los Angeles, so they diverted to San Francisco and declared an emergency. The plane went on to land without further incident. 5 Gs. The G-forces were so intense, it ripped the landing gear down. It was in the up and lock position. It drained the hydraulic fluid from the reservoir, and it ended up in the ocean somewhere, I guess. Who knows where? There are photos that I shared in yesterday's video that they are missing pieces of the tail, literally broke off the airplane. I mean, five Gs. Imagine experiencing five Gs in a 747, a commercial airliner. Uh, it was an eventful flight to say the least. So it's the same question I asked at the beginning. How do you lose over 30,000 feet in two minutes? You have 15,000 flight hours. Your first officer has 7,000 flight hours. Your flight engineer has another 15,000 flight hours. How is it we have such an experienced crew and they ignore the indications? Or the moment we turn the autopilot off, we forget how to fly the airplane. It's what I shared last week in the Instrument Pilot Podcast. And again, I hope you're listening. Just because you're working on your commercial pilot, Humble yourself and still go back. Listen to the Private Pod podcast. Listen to the Instrument Pod podcast. Think ahead to the future. Listen to the CFI podcast. Watch the MZRA videos on YouTube and Facebook. And we, we deliver so much content out there for you to be that good pod who's always learning. One thing I shared last week in the Instrument Pod podcast is how is it we continue to add the most amazing technology yet the accident rate still remains the same? Well, when you read about stories where we turn the autopilot off and we forget how to fly the airplane and trust our instruments, where, where did the basic stick and rudder skill go is what I believe this really comes down to. We've lost this ability of basic, basic stick and rudder flying. Commercial pilots, listen, this is a certificate to keep on learning. There is no greater pressure than adding the external pressures of being a commercial pilot of flying for money. What an external pressure. The pressure of feeling as though you have to be somewhere. That this is a VIP client. I can't say no to them. Whatever it may be, it's so difficult sometimes. That's why we've dedicated an entire podcast just to you all, the commercial pilots and aspiring commercial pilots, because I feel you. I was there. I was the young kid when it's the end of the month and the rent is due and the visibility is bad, but I only got paid when the propeller was spinning. I get it. And that's why we are looking and finding ways to better ourselves as pilots. 
Listen, I hope to see you at Sun and Fun March 31st through April 5th, Hangar D, Hangar Delta. Also, I hope you'll join us March 26th at 3 p.m. on the M0A YouTube and Facebook channels for our JFK Jr. accident analysis and recreation all done live. I'll be able to take your questions live and just interact with you all. Really looking forward to that. Thank you so much for all that you all do. Thank you for your five-star ratings on all our podcasts, uh, the thumbs up on all our videos, the likes on Facebook, the the affirmations and the comments you, you just give us. You truly keep us going. Every single person here at M0A.com is truly dedicated to your success, to your safety. We've built an amazing M0A nation, M0A family that you all are a part of. If there is anything at all we can do this week to help make you a safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Enjoy the rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. We'll see you.